Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5? We want to continue looking at verses 13 through 16. And even though the, this is talking about salt and light, if you will, and not about the, not part of the eight Beatitudes, it really is in many ways a summary of everything that the Beatitudes sought to communicate. So if you don't mind standing with me, I'd like to begin by reading this passage together. Of course, if you're not familiar, Jesus is speaking here, one, probably his most profound message. And he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. And you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a light lamp, uh, a light, excuse me, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we ask that you would help us as we look to your word and to understand it correctly and to apply it effectively. That, Lord, we would never be guilty of those who simply hear your word but don't do anything with it. We want to be those people who have decided to follow Jesus. Grant us this grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As the Apostle Peter uh, ended his second and final letter to the churches, he made a very definitive statement followed by a very simple and challenging question. The statement begins this way. The day of the Lord will come as a thief. The heavens will disappear the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And then he asked this question, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Or as it was once put, how then shall we live? Should we be floating and, and drifting downstream with the flow of the current culture that we're a part of? Or are we those who are supposed to fight against the current? Are we challenging the general assumptions of our culture? Are we, or are we simply being conformed by our pursuit of peaceable comfort? It was C.S. Lewis who said, he said, the most dangerous ideas are not the ones that are being argued, but the ones that are being assumed. In other words, untruths that are assumed because they're so familiar and so common, they're assumed therefore to be true because they're part of the common sense of a culture, do more to shape us and conform us than anything that is obviously wrong, false, or untrue. I mean, it's just common sense. If I know something is wrong, it's false, it's untrue, then I'm going to put it into that category, that trash can of ideas that I'm not going to embrace. But if I believe something to be true that is not true, or as Jesus put it, if you believe that the light that is in you, which is in fact really darkness, how great is that darkness? So that what I believe to be true sometimes are just common assumptions. Maybe I grew up hearing them and never really thought about them. But nonetheless, they have become part of my functional uh, toolbox that I try to deal with life. And often it's only when those tools prove to be the wrong tool for the issues of my life or ineffectual tools that I begin to question their validity. And that really becomes a challenge. Because we have to ask ourselves, how do we navigate through a world where more often than not, that which is wrong is declared to be that which is right? Or even worse, that which is raunchy is declared to be popular. How do we live in that kind of world? Do we compromise? Or on the other end, do we become the reactionaries? You see, compromise obviously is not a good choice, but neither is becoming a reactionary. When we react, we usually overreact. 
And we overreact to whatever is the loudest and the messiest thing going in our culture. And we go, what decent person would think or say something like that? But in the process, what we often do is overlook the things that are ultimately important. The, we overlook the, the foundational dynamics and we under, underreact to the things that are really critical while we overreact to the things that are superficial. And this is really easy to do when you live in a very noisy culture. And we live in the noisiest culture in the world. It's a different kind of noise, but it is a domineering kind of noise. It's amazing when you think about it. Those of us who can remember not too many years getting our first cell phone, I remember my first one. It was 99 cents a minute for a phone call. So don't talk, complain to me about your phone rates. But today there are 500 million tweets every day. Four million hours of content Four million hours of content is being uploaded on YouTube every day. 4.3 billion Facebook messages are posted. Six billion Google searches are conducted. And 205 billion emails are going to be sent out. And most of them are on my spam list. And we have to ask, is this all without effect? Interesting an article I just read this last week by an interview of Sean Parker, who was the founding president of Facebook. In a recent, ama recent amazingly candid interview, he spoke of what he referred to as the consequences of a network when it grows to a billion or two billion people, a network which he was key in creating. He said, it literally changes your relationship with society and with each other. It probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. The thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them, was all about, quote, how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? In other words, he said, our whole goal was mind control. And that means that we need to, the, to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while. Because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. I mean, those of us who are online, we understand this. You post something on Facebook or Instagram and then you wonder, why didn't anybody like it? And you go into a funk. And then when people like it, you feel good about yourself and not realizing what's happened is chemically your brain has just released dopamines that make you feel better about yourself. You literally become addicted to Facebook or Instagram or whatever it else you is you're doing. He says, and what that does, it gets you to contribute more content. Because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever, and that's going to get you to contribute more content, and that's going to get you more likes and more comments. And then he says, it is a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because we're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. Inventors, creators like me, Mark Zuckerberg, Kevin Systrom on Instagram, it's all these people understood this consciously and we did it anyway. We understood it anyway. We understood what we're doing, and we did it anyway because the desire to control in these men's minds, these technocrats, is off the charts. Now, I say this to kind of set a context because we're not unique because as Christians, we're facing cultural challenges. But we are the first people in the history of the world to face it so forcefully and exponentially rapid as what we're being confronted 
with today. It is to call it a tsunami of information and input is to really understate how impactful it is. It's interesting because kids today have never known a quiet world. They don't understand what it means to have a reflective moment. In fact, many psychologists and researchers are beginning to discover that kids today have lost the ability to deal with basic emotional experiences like depression and boredom and passivity and things of that nature because no matter where they are, they immediately can grab a device that engages them at full force, at full speed, totally invested in something on some kind of a device so that they never really have to sit back and say, I'm bored, I don't know what to do. They don't ever have to sit in the back of the car and say, are we there yet? (laughs) Because they have a device. They can watch a movie in their car. And on it goes. As John Stone Street and Brian Hunkel in their book, uh, Practical Guide to the Culture, note, they say every day, speaking of kids in our world, they encounter more information than people learned over the course of their entire lives. Every day, your kid is confronted with more information than people since the beginnings of time ever saw in their entire lifetimes. But in the process, we've become a confused people. We've confused information for knowledge, and we've mistaken knowledge for being the same as wisdom. We know too much, we understand too little, we're lost in a sea of data. In a turn of the words from that old ancient mariner poem, words, words everywhere, but not a drop of truth. Now, if it was just the noise, we could use earplugs. But as Kunkel and Stone Street point out, it's not just noise, it's ideas. And ideas have consequences. They go on to explain. They said, bad ideas have victims. Bad ideas about celebrity and fame and physical appearance leave teenage girls confused, starving, and purging. Bad ideas about masculinity leave young men in perpetual adolescence without purpose and addicted to video games. Bad ideas about sex and relationships fuels the hookup culture on college campuses, leaving students broken, used, and lonely. And then they add, if we can't master ideas, ideas will master us. If we passively absorb the information around us, someone else is thinking for us. You see, historically, when the church has been faced with similar overwhelming cultural changes, it has chosen to respond in one of three ways. The first one is that we can simply meld. (laughs) We can embrace the culture and its values by removing them or ignoring those things which the culture finds offensive. And we see this happening in the church. Increasingly, within the evangelical, Bible-believing, born-again Christian community, we're hearing things like, gay is okay. Same-sex marriage is legal. Abortion is a choice. Gender is fluid. You see, simply what we find is that many churches today have simply chosen to go silent on the most critical cultural issues because they want to avoid the backlash. They'll say things like, well, our faith hasn't changed. We still believe in the Word of God. We just avoid having those kinds of conversations. So as one pastor explained to me, I teach verse by verse through the Bible, but when I come to a verse that sounds condemning, I skip over that and go on to one that talks about how much God loves us. So that we begin to sanitize the message to conform to what we think the culture will accept. So that another pastor can sit in an interview on CNN and simply say, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality and I'm not going to either. 
Or later when he was asked on The View, what, is, is abortion sin? Very direct question. He never answered the question. He talked all over the place with mumbo jumbo, but would never. It took eight days of hounding on the internet before he finally said, well, yeah, it is sin. So what's going on there? The explanation that's given is, well, we're trying to reach the culture, and so we don't want to offend them before they get saved. My question is, do they get saved, or do they just attend? You see, the secondary response is to escape the culture. And granted, there have been times in the history of the church where escape is the only course of survival. In fact, America was founded by, in large in part by people who fled from Europe. In fact, they were fleeing from the church in Europe, whether it be the church in England or the Roman Catholic Church. They fled because they weren't allowed to live their faith out in freedom, and many of them were executed by things, whether it be Bloody Mary in England or, or uh, the Inquisition in Spain or other places like that. They fled for their lives and came to America with one ostensible purpose was to have a freedom of speech and freedom of religion. The foundations upon which our nation is built, which ironically is being eroded even as we speak, or I speak at least. But there's another kind of escapism. That's the seat searching after the Christian utopia where you can control everything you see or you hear. You don't have to struggle with faith issues and faith questions because you're surrounded by people who believe exactly the way you do. And this kind of oftentimes leads to a subtler kind of evil. <laughs> because when you have these cloistered communities of believers, there's this assumption that sin is not going to find an entree there. And believe me, it does because the sin isn't out there. The sin ultimately is in here. And you put two people on a desert island, and what you're going to have is sooner or later, they're going to, one is going to kill the other and eat him for lunch, because that's our savage nature. I think in the words of the Nazi resistor, founder of the White Rose resistance in Nazi Germany during World War II, Hans Scholl and his sister Bonnie, who after they were arrested and eventually were executed by a German tribunal for their resistance to the Nazi party, they simply, he simply wrote, Hans simply wrote in a letter to his sister, he said, should one go off and build a little house with flowers outside the window and a garden outside the door and extol and thank God and turn one's back on the world and its filth? And then he posed the challenging question, isn't seclusion a form of treachery, of desertion? I am weak and I am puny, he writes, but I want to do what is right. Somebody, after all, has to make the first start. He and their, their friends all perished because of that commitment. But as another Nazi resistor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who also was executed by the Nazis, simply put it, we are saved for something. We are saved for something. And that something is what I think I, our, it's our third choice, that we're saved to engage the culture, not to embrace it, not to escape from it, but to engage that culture. I love to paraphrase how Eugene Peterson put it. He said, Jesus didn't just love the world, he moved into the neighborhood. He didn't just love the ghetto of humanity, he moved into the ghetto. And he lived amongst the rats and the fleas and all the things that plague humanity. And that's why, in fact, in the first century jargon that Jesus used, he says, he has called you and me to be salt and light. How do we engage our culture in a way that informs and influences and ultimately impacts it, not just with the message of the gospel, but with the life of the gospel? How do we impact it with the life of the gospel? 
There are really three ways that we do it. The first thing is sharing his word in its fullness. I think this is one of the most strategic errors the church has made in kind of skipping over or dumbing down the scriptures, kind of giving the idea, well, that was Old Testament and doesn't really apply to us anymore. Well, you can't take Jesus' words completely literal. Actually, he was just using metaphors, which in a sense is, yes, there are metaphors that illustrate But the metaphors illustrated something that he wanted us to take quite literally. And I think that's where we began to mess up. We stop taking it literally. We stop treating it as if it's the word of God. And it begins to become, in the minds of the culture, just kind of some religious suggestions that Jesus happened to toss out and may or may not be recorded and recalled correctly. So therefore, we become the ultimate arbiter of what is true and what is not true. We become really the divine authority who decides what governs our life. And that's become cultural Christianity. That is the functional Gnosticism that really governs over the thinking of an increasing number of professing Christians in our culture. So that when you say certain things with regards to the Word of God, the Bible says this, people, Christians will look at you and say, well, I don't believe that. I remember having, teaching a class one time and I shared something and I had any, and for some reason I said, does anybody have any questions? And this one gentleman said, well, I just don't agree with that. And I said, what is it you don't agree with? Well, I don't agree with what you just said. I said, okay, I'm all ears. Tell me what's wrong with what I said. Well, I just don't agree with it. Wait a minute. Do you disagree with it because you don't like what it says or you disagree with it because you don't think I presented it right? Oh no, I think you presented it right. I just disagree with what it says. So, what do you do with that? But you see, that's become okay because we have a cultural norm that says, a cultural influence that says, your feelings are what are most important. As Mark Sayer in his book, The Road Trip That Changed the World, where he talked about the powerful influence philosophically of Jack Kerouac in his book, The Road Trip, which spawned not only the beatnik movement, but also the hippie movement, with this underlying idea that if it feels good, then do it, which is a way of saying if it makes you happy, that's the way you should live your life. Because he ultimately said, the journey is more important than the destination. And I agree with that until you reach the destination. And as Kerouac was lying, dying of lung cancer, suddenly the destination became critical and he repented of his life and asked Christ into his heart after poisoning an entire generation. You see, the destination doesn't matter until you reach the destination. And as someone once said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up someplace else. We need to make sure that we understand what the message is and what the destination is. That the destination ultimately is what lies on the other side of death. It's the only place that everyone in this room eventually will come to. I don't care what pathway you take to get to whatever summit you want to get to. At the end, that all those pathways do converge in one point. But it's not nirvana. It's not utopia. It's not Valhalla. It's not the sandala of life. It's none of those kind of things. What it is ultimately is death itself. And it says in Hebrews 9, 27, it is given unto every man once to die, then the judgment. And at that moment, the judgment becomes the destination. And suddenly the destination has eternal meaning for everything that we've done in this life. We become a church that is so absorbed in teaching how people can live their best life now that we've forgotten that the ultimate goal is not to be happy in the present form that I'm in, but to be in the presence of God where all joy is to be found. That your life on this planet may be full of, and if I can use the French word, a whole bunch of crappy stuff. But that crappy stuff doesn't define my life. What defines my life is Jesus Christ. 
and the promise that I have of eternal life. So that when people say, I'm not into that pie in the sky, buy and buy stuff, you will when you finish your dinner and you're waiting for dessert. And that's when you're going to get your just desserts. That if we're going to engage our culture, we have to stop apologizing for the Bible. And if you feel like there's things that you can't defend, then you need to start studying. You need to start doing a little research to figure out maybe it isn't as antiquated as you think. But secondly, we need to have thoughtful arguments. Many of us want to simply throw off the challenges of the world around us with some kind of clever cliché. There may have been a day when we could say, look, and Jesus said, said it, and that settles it. And I still believe that's true. But the problem is the people I'm talking to don't believe that Jesus said it. And so I find I have to begin by saying, you know what? But we know historically, documentary, we're talking about textual criticism and all these things. We know for a fact that Jesus said this stuff. It's more likely that he said what he said than Julius Caesar or even William Shakespeare said what he said. And people don't understand that. And we don't understand it because we have bought into the arguments. And there are libraries full of books who deal with these issues, and yet many Christians have never taken a moment to even consider reading one of them. We need to teach the Word in its fullness. We need to be thoughtful in our arguments. And part of that means we have to understand what the arguments really are. We have to, to listen to what people are saying so that we understand that we respond accordingly, not just simply pop off with quick answers. But more important than either of these two is, although interconnected, that we need to engage the world through the fierceness of our faith. We need a fierce faith. In fact, part of the whole issue of a baptism is, as uh, J.B. Phillips put it in his translation of Matthew 10, 32, he says, unless you will publicly confess me as your Savior, I will not confess you before my Father in heaven. There's a kind of a stealth Christianity that tries to fly under the cultural radar that doesn't cause it to stand out because you know what happens once that radar picks you up, it's going to begin firing missiles at you of all kinds. So if I can just fly under the radar and never, okay, let's pray before we eat in the restaurant, but let's pretend like we're looking at our phones. And in fact, I've had Christians tell me I don't even pray in public anymore because it's too, too ostentatious. Really? <laughs> Why don't you admit it? You're just embarrassed. You don't want people thinking you're weird because you're praying over your food. We need to have a fierceness about our faith, friends. We need to hold it so tightly and so deeply and so dearly that we are not afraid of any challenge, that we are always, as Paul would tell, the, tell Timothy, to give a reason for the hope that we have. Someone once noted, Christian makes a great verb, but a lousy noun. You know the difference? <laughs> Christian is great when it's an expression of what you're doing with your life, but if it's just a title that you wear, a name that you have on your tag, then that's pretty lousy. It's got to be something deeper than that. And that's why Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount by really kind of outlining what salt and light actually looks like in our world. That living salt and light is, first of all, being humble and broken and spiritually empowered rather than being strong in our own strength. It's about being desperate for God and merciful to wrongdoers and to separate ourselves from evil and yet be peacemakers and peaceable to those who are evil, being willing to forgive them when they treat us unfairly. 
And we do all that because we want heaven more than we want earth. We want to know inner peace more than outward prosperity. We want spiritual fulfillment more than external success. We want to see God rather than seeking ourselves. And we want to be willing to change to become better so that we can know lasting joy and not just temporarily, temporary happiness. Or as Paul put it so succinctly to the Ephesians, we want to become imitators of God in Christ Jesus. Most importantly, this is not just simply something that we're supposed to do. It's who we already are if indeed Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. It's not something we're called to do. It's what Christ did when He recreated us in Himself. In that moment when we receive Christ, not only was my life changed by receiving the new birth in Jesus Christ, but I became essentially, as a changed man, became a world changer. I became a lifesaver who went into the world to change the world because my life had been saved from the previous world that once ruled and controlled and governed over my life. It's what Paul spoke about to the Colossians when he said, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations is now disclosed. What is the mystery? God has chosen to make known the glorious mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. He wants to make that known by letting that glory shine forth from your life. You are not called to be salt light. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world which tells me that everything you need to be salt in your life is already inside of you. All that is necessary is what Jesus said at the end of that passage, let your light shine. Allow it to shine. Open up the windows and the doors of your life so that the light that's in you can become evident to those who are outside of you. Let it out. Why did he liken it to salt and light? Those are certainly metaphors that he uses to illustrate something more spiritual. But there are certain qualities about these two elements that are notable and applicable. That first of all, when we talk about salt, salt was one of the most valuable and treasured commodities of the ancient world. One of the things that made Israel a wealthy country is the Dead Sea, which was the Salt Sea. In fact, I have it in my office, chunks of salt that I just simply reached into the Dead Sea and plucked up. Now, the problem is that that salt isn't pure salt. Those chunks aren't pure salt. If you touch it, it's greasy to the touch. There are over 35 different chemicals that are composed with a lot of dirt and rock and other things beside that. And that's why he said when the salt loses its saltiness, and some of us go, well, salt never loses its saltiness. Oh, this salt did. Because they put that chunk on the table and they would pick the salt out from it and remove from it the dirt. And finally, you get to a point where there's more impurities in the salt than there is salt. And the only thing it's good for is to take out and throw it out in the pathways and on the roads because it was enough salt to kill the vegetation and keep the road clean. And here's what Jesus was simply saying. He says, when the salt becomes so commingled with the culture, it loses its saltiness. That's what he was talking about. When the salt becomes so compromised by the culture, it loses its distinctness. Because the three things that stand out about salt is that it has a distinct and accentuating flavor that stimulates the appetite. It stimulates the appetite. Now, my wife always scolds me because I'm a heavy salt user. And I'm telling her, honey, I'm just trying to be biblical.
But one of the most common criticisms I hear on Chopped, and I, my wife and I watch that quite a bit, especially right before dinner so we go to hung, bed hungry. <laughs> they say there's just not enough salt. It's this thing that accentuates the flavor, whether it's a sweet thing or a salty thing. There's something about it that accentuates flavor. And he's saying to you, when you become salt in the world, the very presence of Christ in you begins to stimulate an appetite. The people simply are engaged with your life because it is distinct. When I'm sitting on an airplane and somebody says to me, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm endeavoring to be a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ to the best of my ability. I love that because the, the blank stare on their face like, what? <laughs> no, I'm endeavoring to, to know this word and to read it and to absorb it and to live it out as best I can. And suddenly, you've created an appetite in this person for for more information so that the hidden Christian, the subtle Christian, the, the stealth Christian is going through life holding the salt inside of the salt shaker when Jesus says, let the salt out of the salt shaker. Stop apologizing. Stop being embarrassed. Stop acting as if this is something that you, well, I don't want to be pushy my goodness gracious, we live in one of the pushiest cultures in the world. I sit and turn on the TV and realize how many things are wrong with me. Because I'm not taking some prescription drug or buying some product. I have the wrong insurance. I, in fact, I have the wrong head. This is supposed to look like, you know, Brad Pitt or something, and it doesn't. My wife says it looks a lot like at the empty pit. No. <laughs> the memory is going, I confess. <laughs> but salt stimulates the appetite, but secondly, what it does, it purifies us. Salt was used as a cleansing for wounds, and it does purify it. It's a painful cleanse, but it will kill bacteria. It will steal away the moisture that bacteria and viruses need to survive. But thirdly, it preserves. Basically, he's saying that a Christ-like life stimulates other people's appetite for God. And it turns their appetite away from corrupt things and encourages them to stay there and to pursue Him. You know, historically, Christian Christianity has been, and this is something that gets very little press, but historians will tell you it's true, that Christianity has had the most profoundly uplifting effect upon human culture from the beginning of its foundations in the first century. That when you begin to look at human rights, women's rights, children's rights, the abolition of slavery, marriage, family, education, science, free enterprise, the arts, music, literature, literacy, all of these great cultural movements started within the church. Have you ever seen the founding of an atheist hospital? You won't find one. Now they may be run by atheists, and now they may be driven by the bottom line, but even like hospitals like Sacred Heart and Holy Family were founded, and Deaconess were founded by Christian missionaries who simply said, we have an obligation, according to the gospel, to care for the sick and the poor. Because you see, Christianity has, is the only religious system that has this concept of a gracious God who loves a sinful world and came into it to redeem and save that world and set him free. Jesus alone set the platform for healing of disease and illness instead of viewing it as being a curse from God or demons or whatever that needed to be exercised by some incantation. The healing arts didn't start in Greece or 
where a skeptic came from. I mean, you begin to study this thing, you realize we've co-opted all these symbols, by, but left out the history behind them so that people believe that this somehow was inherent to human nature, and it wasn't. It was the gospel that changed the way we see the world around us. And here's what's really interesting. I believe that really one of the things that Paul was saying in 2 Thessalonians 2 is that the church will continue to be salt and light in the culture until the day he takes the church out of the way. I believe that the church is that restrainer from evil that Paul was speaking about and that he will continue to restrain until he is taken out of the way. The day when the church leaves the world is going to be a disastrous day. In fact, I read one article not too long ago where they were simply pointing out that 80% of all homeless shelters are run by Christian organizations. And if the Christians were to decide that they would no longer feed the hungry and the poor and do these things, there would be an overwhelming avalanche of people in desperation for housing and shelter and food and clothing. Many of the things that many of you are involved in personally, and I praise God for that. But it wouldn't happen were it not for the fact that people were compelled by their faith to not close their eyes to the needs of the culture that is dying under its own sinfulness, but to bring them not only help, but also to bring them the hope. Because help without hope only delays the inevitable. The people who need help need hope. And they need the hope of the gospel, the hope that God can heal them, the hope that God can save them, the hope that God can fix their scattered and savage lives, both now and for eternity. In somewhat of a similar way, light affects us, that light stimulates sight, that light is the thing that creates that curiosity in us that wants to know what God said and know what his word is all about. That's why we often translate it to be enlightened. That light makes things that are not visible suddenly visible. It not only creates an appetite or a curiosity, but it creates a clarity that suddenly we see life as it meant to be. I'll never forget that moment I got up off my knees after receiving Christ and walking out of that pastor's house and as I'm going down the road, suddenly clarity in my life that I had been meditating and fasting and doing yoga and doing drugs. I remember one of my friends when I first introduced me to LSD and he said, oh man, he says, I dropped acid and I locked myself in a closet and it was incredible the things I saw. I opened my mind and I'm just listening, hanging on his every word thinking, maybe this will work for me. And I said like, well, like what did you see? And he said, I can't remember. (laughs) But it was powerful, man. It was profound. What's wrong with this picture? (laughs) It clarifies. And light also can kill viruses and bacteria by cleansing the body. Again, it, it heals hearts and it heals heads. But as Jesus is telling us, there are two things that are really enemies to you being salt and light. They're the obstacles, the barriers, the things that get in the way. He, he offers these simple warnings. He said, be careful that the salt doesn't lose its saltiness. And as I've suggested already, what that's talking about is compromise. Be careful that you don't begin to compromise the doctrine. Because once you compromise the doctrine, you begin to compromise your behavior. And that's when you'll do the second thing. He says, When a light is hidden, nobody puts it under a bowl. The whole purpose of life, light becomes denied when you do that. But the minute you begin to compromise, not only your faithfulness and commitment to his word, but but the following compromise of your behavior, you will start living in a hidden life. A hidden life. You'll, You'll start hiding certain things because 
You don't want them to be exposed. And this leads to a kind of spiritual cowardice. I think many Christians live like cowards. They're cowering in fear and intimidation of the world that we're in. They, they see the tsunami of, of all these things that are coming their way and they're trying to figure out how can I stand for my faith without actually having to stand up? And yet as uh, Hans Scholl said, somebody has to start. As he's looking at an entire nation drooling over Adolf Hitler, calling him literally the Messiah. The church itself is bowing down at the altar of Nazism. And this 20-year-old young man stands up and says, it's got to start someplace. Somebody has to speak up. Somebody has to begin to do something. And amazingly, that became the, the beginning of an entire movement in Germany to bring down the Nazi government. We hear very little about these courageous young men and young women. But what were they motivated by? Not politics. They were motivated as followers of Jesus Christ. They knew as Christians, like Luther before them said, here I stand, I can do nothing else. And so today, 500 years after Luther stood before the Diet of Worms and made that proclamation, here you are still honoring and talking about the profound effect of his life and the impact it had upon our world. We still talk with reverent tones about men like Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Hans Scholl and others who paid the ultimate price because they were willing to stand up against the evil that the rest of the world was quite amazingly applauding. But one thing we know about is as their life was changed by the gospel, they began to become world changers. And that person can be you. You have that same salt in you. You have that same light in you so that you are the light of the world. You are the salt. And the only thing that hinders that is our own compromise and cowardice. Today we're giving the opportunity for folks to be baptized. And I find that... um, For me, being baptized was a a critical juncture in my walk with God. I'd been a Christian for an entire week. I had seven days to grasp the depths of Christian theology. And even though I knew that when I asked Christ in my heart, my life had been impacted and changed, I, I remember how challenging it was because it became so public (laughs) <laughs> you know, we often say, well, I want to get baptized in a context where it's not really, you know, upfront and personal. I don't want to be embarrassed and, uh, or feel awkward and on stage. But for me, I'm, I'm sitting in a circle of friends in a park and uh, something we often did to smoke dope and just hang out. And I, I wasn't partaking, but I was in with the group and just kind of being invisible amongst the crew Suddenly, Mike Burke, one of my buddies, <laughs> drives up and pulls up beside me where I'm in the park and all these people. I mean, there was probably 40 or 50, maybe 60 kids my age just hanging out and looking for trouble. And he pulls up, rolls down the window on that cherry 57 Rambler station wagon. <laughs> <laughs> Things packed with kids. And he yells out across the park in a loud voice, Hey, Ortiz, you want to get baptized? And everybody turns and looks at me. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I remember that moment sitting there going, Am I going to pretend like I didn't hear that? 
And thank God, because it had to be God. I said, yeah. And I got up and I walked into that car. And we went out to a muddy lake. I mean muddy. (laughs) And I got baptized, not really even getting what that was all about. But I just know when I came up out of that water, I felt like Jesus was confessing that he was my Lord Master. I wasn't just me confessing it. It was him confessing me in, in the face before his Father in heaven. I just, I knew that, and I knew that my life was changed because I went public for the first time. And that's what we're really challenging, those of you who are professing faith in Christ. This becomes kind of that juncture because it's, admittedly, you can come in here and kind of, kind of sit in the midst and kind of, you know, sing or not sing and go along with it. But Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, if you confess me before men, you acknowledge me before men in a public way, I'll do it before my Father in heaven. Because he knew that only then do we really kind of put legs under our faith. (laughs) Up until then, it's just something we might talk about in the right context. But when we stand up and take that movement, I, you know, there, there's some of you who are new in the faith and there's some of you who came prepared to do this. There's some of you who did not come here today. You had no idea. You didn't get enough advance warning to know not to be here. <laughs> but it simply may be that you also are one of those who has been a follower of Jesus, but you've never, never done this. Um, And you see, the reason I I emphasize this is because I get paid by the head. (laughs) For those of you who are from Chewila, that was a joke. (laughs) No. But this becomes the opportunity. And so the worship team is going to come out and we're going to, they'll begin leading us in some time of worship. I would just simply say, if you know that you need to do this, whether you came prepared for it or not, we came prepared for you. We have shorts, we have t-shirts, we have towels, we have robes, we have the whole, we have the whole thing back there. And if you see Sean's over there in the corner, Sean, would you, and Sam next to him, these guys are here to help you guys. We've got a, a dressing areas where you can change and if you didn't come prepared. But I just want to invite you, if you want to get baptized, that you head over for that door over there. And those folks are, as you see them heading there, they're going to be there to help you go through the whole process. I know that there's, for some of you, there's a conversation going on in your head. Well, maybe next time. (sighs) If you're like me, I can do that the rest of my life. Maybe next time. Today is the day. You're here, you're challenged. This talking head, this windbag is in your face. Do it, because the time is right. Follow through.